Welcome to Bible Baptist Church live stream services. We'd like to invite you to comment and to like and share uh, the video as you watch below. And we want to start with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time. Thank you for all those who are joining us. So I pray that we can uh, focus and listen and uh, worship you through this time at home and on live stream with us. So Lord, I pray you please bless the music and bless the preaching. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Take your Bibles and turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2 this morning. And uh, while you turn there, and once you find your place, uh, hold your place there and look up this way, I want you to think about this. Uh, the, we refer to Jesus as the man of sorrows. And the Bible says that he was a man of sorrows, that he was acquainted with grief. And no doubt the Lord Jesus Christ had a very challenging life and that he died a very excruciating death on the cross. But uh, I wonder, though, do you think that that means that the life of the Lord Jesus Christ was absent of joy? You know, as we study the book of Philippians, the book of Philippians is a book that is about joy. And uh, I believe that if you and I will heed the things that are contained in the book of Philippians, that you and I can have joy in our lives. And the Bible tells us in Psalm 16, verse number 11, Thou wilt show me the path of life, in thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. We think about how that in the presence of God, in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, that there, is, that there is joy. And how could he offer something that he did not have in his own life? Uh, I believe that uh, the Christian life is not one of misery. If you're miserable as a Christian, then you're living beneath your privilege. Uh, you are not, uh, you're not doing something right. Because the Christian life is one of joy. And it is one of joy because we can follow the pattern uh, that is given to us by the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, I believe that though Jesus uh, did have a challenging life, that he was born uh, in a manger, that he uh, lived in, uh, in uh, Nazareth and wandered the shores of Galilee and uh, was a man who was without a place to lay his head, uh, that though he experienced the great betrayal of Judas Iscariot, uh, the betrayal of a deep friendship there, and face the excruciating death on the cross, that even in the midst of circumstances like that, that the Lord Jesus Christ had joy. You see, our emotions oftentimes are dependent upon our circumstances. It shouldn't be that way, uh, but sometimes they are. And uh, our circumstances tend to always be changing, but our joy, when it's found in the Lord, can always be consistent. But how can you have the joy of Jesus in your life? What were the secrets of Jesus' joy? Well, I want you to know that there are three keys to the joy of Jesus that we find in this passage as we read it together. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. And the Bible says in Philippians chapter 2, verse number 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And here's the mindset that you and I ought to have in those verses that are following. And we're going to look at those step by step, walking through this passage this morning. 
And, uh, but if you and I are going to have joy, it's going to come from having that same mental attitude that Jesus had. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. You want to have a mind of joy, then you need the mind of Jesus. Uh, the joy of Jesus is found, first of all, in what you give up. It is found in what you give up. John Maxwell says, uh, you have to give up to go up. And uh, he talks about that in his uh, book, The 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership, and when he talks about the law of sacrifice. But the point that he's making is that if you would desire to be successful as a leader, uh, according to his book, uh, then it's going to require that you make sacrifice. I want to tell you that and if you're going to be able to achieve success in any area of life, then it's going to require sacrifice. But I'll also tell you this, that if you are going to experience joy, then it's going to require sacrifice. But no one has ever sacrificed more than the Lord Jesus Christ. And he left for us a tremendous example uh, that we should follow concerning this sacrifice. Think of what Jesus gave up according to this passage. In verses 6 and 7, the Bible says, "...who being in the form of God..." thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. What did Jesus give up in this passage? Well, theologians have often argued about what it was specifically that Jesus gave up. Some people have said that it was uh, his divine attributes, but in truth, he really exercised many of those divine attributes while he was here on this earth. Although I believe that in meekness, he chose to limit those things. We see him exercising omnipotence by... Um, by uh, commanding over the devils and casting out devils and, and raising the dead to life again and healing the many sick and lame and multiplying the bread for the thousands. Uh, certainly he demonstrated his divine attributes when he uh, demonstrated omniscience. The Bible tells us several times that he knew that they reasoned in their hearts. He could read the hearts and the minds of those who were present with him. He knew what they were thinking. He knew what they were feeling. Uh, he exercised some form of omnipresence when he uh, indicated that he knew what was taking place in geographic locations where he was not physically present during his lifetime. He did not give up his deny divine attributes. He did choose to limit those, but I do believe that he gave up uh, many of the rights and the glory that he deserved as he was eternally existent with the Father. Who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. The word thought it not robbery means that it, he did not see it as a thing to be seized, a thing to be held fast, or a thing to be retained. Uh, he, uh, though he was in the form of God, he did not uh, hold fast that form. He did not seize that form. He did not retain that form. But instead, he gave up that glory, and he gave up his divine rights and came and lived here among you and among me and suffered the scorn and scoffing and the ridicule of lowly men and sinners such as I and such as you. Basically, <clears throat> what we see is that the Creator fashioned himself like unto his creation. Think of all that Jesus gave up. You see, uh, the Greeks and the Romans had in their pantheon many gods that they served and worshipped uh, there um, along Mount Olympus. And, uh, and all of these stories that they created in their own mind, they being creatures made uh, their own gods after the fashion of, uh, of creation. And um, first the man makes a god, and then the god makes a man. And uh, that's what they did, is that they um, made their own idols, but their idols were just like common, everyday, uh, terrible people with exaggerated personalities and uh, sinful habits and behaviors that were worse than most people that you and I know. But you see, Jesus was not like unto those gods, which you'd find in the Parthenon and the Pantheon and all of those temples in Rome and in Greece. Instead, he was the perfect creator, and he became like unto his creation. 
In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Bible tells us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. A marvelous thing when we consider all that Jesus gave up. And in giving up all of those things, the Bible tells us that he thought it not robbery. And what that tells me is this, that he saw that there was something greater and more important on the other side of all the things that he gave up. And the Bible tells us that for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. He, he had joy before him. And that because of that joy, he was able to live through this uh, life and to face much of the disappointments that he faced with the cruel mockery and the rejection of his people. And, uh, and he faced all of those things willingly because with joy, there was something that was waiting for him on the other side. And what I want you to understand is that if you and I would have joy, as Jesus had joy, it's going to require that you and I live a life of sacrifice. Sacrifice. As with success, you must give up to go up, but as with joy, you must give up to go up. If you'd have joy, then you're going to need to give up the idea that you need to demand your rights, demand your entitlement, demand your uh, certain treatment, demand certain possessions, demand certain kinds of services. When you go around demanding all of those things, expecting all of those things for yourself, then you will be severely disappointed when you do not receive them. But someone has rightly said that the foundation of gratitude is the expectation of nothing. And uh, when you and I get to a place where we understand that we were formed of the dust of the ground and that anything that we receive uh, in this life is but by God's grace and by God's mercy, uh, then you and I can be grateful for all of the things that he gives to us and all of the things that we receive. But you see, in this book of Philippians, there's a great warning that takes place of certain things that will rob us and uh, of our joy and steal away uh, the privilege that you and I have for the joy that we could experience. Numerous times throughout the book of Philippians, there is a warning about contention and about strife, about vainglory, about old fashioned pride. When we have pride in our lives, then it will steal away our joy. And in Philippians chapter one, you'll recall that uh, Paul referred to those who uh, preach Christ of contention, supposing to add to Paul's affliction. I'd say that those people were perhaps miserable, even as they ministered the gospel, that they were doing so in such a way uh, that they were intending to be contentious in their ministry of the gospel. But you see, even though in their contention they were adding affliction to Paul's bondage, Paul was there in the prison rejoicing and experiencing joy. And he said, I there and do rejoice uh, because the gospel is preached. And uh, although there were some who were preaching by uh, contention and some who were preaching uh, for uh, Christ of compassion, but Paul was glad that the gospel was going forward and he was joying and rejoicing. Uh, it was his own sacrifice being made in his very own body there in the prison that allowed him to experience joy because there was something that was worthwhile on the other side of that sacrifice. Uh, I think about in this particular chapter, the Apostle Paul warned, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but each in lowliness of mind esteem other better than self. Uh, strife is when we try to push others down and vainglory is when we try to pull ourselves up. It's two sides of the same coin and both sides smack of old-fashioned pride. When we have pride in our lives, it will keep us and prevent us from being able to have joy in our hearts. And finally, in chapter 4, you'll require, you'll, uh, you'll, we'll learn and we'll study as we continue in this series in the future that there's a church feud which is taking place between Euodius and Syntyche. And uh, these two ladies are not getting along with one another, but Paul encourages them to become true yoke fellow. That is to be serving together, striving together in the faith of the gospel. And so there is that theme 
of the warning about contention and about pride, about selfishness, about strife, about vain glory creeping up into your lives to steal your joy away. But on the other side of that, though, uh, if only by pride cometh contention, I, wanna, I want you to understand that there is great harmony and there can be great unity and uh, there can be great cooperation and great joy therewith when there is humility. We see the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us in, uh, in verses 6 and 7, "...who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation." And what did he do? He took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man. The form of a servant. And Jesus, uh, the, uh, the very God, the very pre-existing God, the very creator of the universe, took upon flesh and came and dwelt here on this earth uh, with you and with me and took upon him the form of a servant. And yet, in this servitude, he found joy in his life. Joy in serving others and a joy in cooperating with others, joy in agreement and unity and harmony uh, with others. And throughout the book of Philippians, there is a warning against contention, and there's a warning against strife, and there is a warning against pride and strife and vainglory. But there is a promotion toward unity, toward fellowship, toward agreement in every single chapter. It talks about the fellowship of the gospel in uh, Philippians chapter number 1, and the faith of the gospel, striving together for the faith of the gospel, a cooperation to get uh, the gospel out and to encourage others to believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's joy in these things. And then here in this passage, uh, he encourages us in chapter 2, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but each in lowliness of mind esteem other better than self. And then he goes on to encourage us to be of the same mind, the same love, and in one accord, cooperating with one another. Then he encourages Yodius and Syntyche uh, in chapter 3, that there would be true yoke fellow, to get in the same yoke with one another, plowing together as two oxen would uh, plow. And so there's that encouragement that we have to give up our personal rights and to give up our, uh, our own uh, agenda, our own strife, our own pride, so that the Lord Jesus Christ could be honored, could be glorified, and that is where joy is going to be found. Misery certainly is found in strife and vainglory, but joy is found in humiliation and selflessness. You see, joy is first of all about what you give up, but second of all, joy is about what you take on. Uh, Joy is found in what you give up, but joy is also found in what you take on. And the Bible tells us in verse number 7 that he made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man. This is the example that is given to us in this passage that you and I would be willing to give up some things so that we might take on some other things. There's a wonderful picture of Jesus as a servant that's found in John 13, verses 3 through 17. And you can hold your place there in Philippians chapter 2. We'll come back to that in just a moment and look at John 13, 3 through 17 if you'd like to. But otherwise, you can listen to me as I read it. And it says this, that Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand and that he was come from God and that he went to God, He riseth up from supper, and layeth aside his garments, and took a towel, and girded himself, that after he poureth the water into the basin, and began to wash his disciples' feet, and to wipe them with the towel, wherewith he was girded. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? And Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. But Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. And Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my hand. Jesus saith unto him, uh, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is every whit clean. And ye are clean, but not all. For he knew who should betray him. Therefore said he, You are not all clean. So after he had washed their feet and taken his garments and sat down 
again, he said unto them, Know ye not that I have done unto you? Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye shall, should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither is there one greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, happy are ye if you do them. You see, this task which was performed by the Lord Jesus Christ in washing his feet, uh, washing the feet of the disciples, was a task which was performed by the lowest of servants to wash the feet of the dinner guests. But while the disciples were sitting around the table debating who would be the greatest in the kingdom, Jesus girded himself with a towel and he came and washed the feet of those very same disciples. But while he was doing that, we get a picture of what true humility really is. The Bible says that Jesus, knowing that the Father had given him all things into his hands and that he was come from God and that he went to God, he riseth up from supper and uh, laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. You see, uh, humility is not thinking lowly of oneself. Humility is just not thinking of oneself at all. You see, Jesus had a right understanding and a right attitude uh, concerning who he really was. And Jesus was not lowly in the sense that he was poor-mouthing himself and thinking terribly of himself and just doing low things uh, so that he had some kind of a martyr complex there on that particular day. But what was Jesus doing? Knowing full well uh, that the Father had given all things into his hands. And knowing full well what he was going to be facing there on the cross. And knowing full well all that he was and all that he deserved. He rose up from supper and got among those bickering disciples and he washed their feet. Now, it's a wonderful picture when we see the strife and vainglory which was taking place around the table. But it's an even greater picture when we consider that one of the things is that he said that not all of those who were present there that day were clean. And who was he talking about? None other than Judas Iscariot. And he knew that Judas was at the table. And he knew that Judas would be the one who would betray him. And yet Jesus washed the feet of every single disciple, including Judas Iscariot, uh, including Peter, who would later deny him, but Judas, who would betray him. And he sent those clean feet out later on after the dinner to go and to sell him off for the price of a slave. Think about the humility that's involved. Not just with serving. He served his friends, but he served his enemies that day. And when Jesus Christ died on the cross, it was the greatest picture of sacrifice and servitude. As uh, the Bible tells us, he died not for our sins only, but for the sins of the entire world. There was no exclusion to the grace of Lord Jesus Christ uh, being available to everyone in the history of the world if they would but believe. It's an incredible thing. But it leaves for us an example that you and I ought to live our lives of, as lives of service. And that if you and I would have joy in our hearts, it will not be found in being self-serving. It will be found in being self-sacrificing. And it will be found in serving and loving others. I have uh, frequently mentioned that my wife, when she was younger, her mother taught, their, uh, taught uh, the Molinax girls, uh, were taught by their mother, uh, that when they were feeling bad or feeling down or feeling depressed or discouraged, that the best thing that they could do was to go and serve other people. And at our church at Tabernacle, <clears throat> we had a couple of uh, ministries there, which we called ministries of pure religion. The Bible says in James chapter 1 uh, that pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, uh, visiting the fatherless and the widows and their affliction. And so right there on the property at Tabernacle, we had a children's home, uh, the fatherless. And uh, just up on the hill above the children's home was a widow's apartment. And uh, so we had a couple of ministries of pure religion there. And uh, my mother-in-law would sometimes, when she was feeling a little drained from working as a Christian school teacher and keeping up a family and doing all those things, uh, would put the girls in the car 
And they would go over to those widows' apartments and visit those little old ladies up there on the hill. And you know what? When they went there to try to be a blessing, 100% of the time they received a blessing. And my wife always has so many stories to tell about going and visiting some of those ladies up there and uh, enjoying spending time talking to them and listening to them tell stories. And it meant so much to those ladies, but it meant so much to my wife as a young girl uh, who was growing up. But it meant so much to my mother-in-law, who oftentimes, uh, in the midst of some challenging times in life, had gone and spent time trying to visit and invest in other people. But the way that you're going to find your path to joy is to learn to serve others. When I was a Bible college student, I remember that I was... uh, uh, I had finished up a project and I had to hole punch it or something. I don't remember what was going on. But I remember specifically I needed to use the hole punch. And I borrowed it from the computer lab just down the hallway. And I was in, uh, I was in transit between the, the computer lab and my classroom where these notes were going to be put in the binder or else uh, the um, project was going to be turned in, whatever was happening that day. And as I was going between the two uh, locations, I somehow I held the hole punch in such a way that all those little bitty holes from all the papers that all those college students have been punching for whatever length of time fell all over the floor. And uh, it was pretty embarrassing. Uh, I was, uh, so I got down on my hands and knees and started uh, scooping all those up and uh, lots of, and some people were passing by, just walking by in the hallway and some people laughed and so on. I was kind of like the, um, the, uh, the man who had fallen among thieves in the story of the Good Samaritan, you know, everybody passed by on the other side. But here came one of our Bible college professors, not just any Bible college professor, but the uh, vice president of our Bible college, who, I don't know, he must stand about this tall, <laughs> Dr. Mark Rasmussen. Uh, he is a very, very tall man. And so there he was, and uh, he came up to me and kind of looked down. But then he stooped down on the ground, and he started helping me pick those up. And while I was down there, he told me, he said, you know, uh, Anthony, you're my friend, and um, uh, I want to be a blessing to you. You've been a blessing to me. And I'll never forget those words, and I'll never forget that action. But it made a difference to me to have somebody come alongside of me and take a low position to encourage me and to help me. You know, too often times we spend our time trying to, uh, to evoke strife in, our, in the pursuit of our own vain glory. But when you find yourself in pride trying to rise up in some way or trying to point your, uh, people to yourself, uh, the best way to resolve that kind of a problem or that kind of issue is to stoop and to serve others. Because you cannot look down on a person when you're washing their feet. And I want to tell you that the way to go up is to give up. And uh, joy is going to be found in your life by what you give up. Joy is going to be found in your life by what you take on. And joy is going to be found in your life by who you look to. Who you look to. In Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 8, And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Here's what the Lord Jesus Christ did. Uh, The Bible tells us that he came... And that he was born in a manger, that he lived a perfect sinless life. He was a man of sorrows. He was acquainted with grief. Uh, But he set his face toward Calvary. And uh, he was born for the purpose of dying for your sins and for my sins. And he never looked back. And the Bible tells us, in fact, that no man takes his life, but that he laid it down. Jesus voluntarily sacrificed himself on the cross. Fooey with all of this idea of arguing about whether or not the Jews crucified Jesus or whether or not the Romans crucified Jesus. Uh, Whoever it is earthly and humanly that we might blame, it was for you and for me that he willingly laid his life down on the cross. And he did it willingly and gladly because in his heart he had absolute, complete, unreserved obedience and surrender to the Father. 
And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And I want to tell you that when you know that the person that you are laboring for, the person that you are serving under, the person that you are looking to has your best interest in mind, then you can have joy no matter what circumstances that you may find yourself in today. A couple of years ago, I was interviewing uh, Bible college students for a ministry position here at our church. And as I was uh, interviewing them, I uh, realized that in all of those interviews that we only had enough room for one person on our staff. And so I knew I would talk to multiple people and that, uh, that I would not be able to hire all of them. And um, so as we were, as I was at various Bible colleges, I thought, you know, I think the best thing for me to do in this interview process is not just to find a person who will be able to help and assist me, but also to be a blessing to those who I interview. And uh, so I, I wanted to be able to cultivate a relationship with some of those students and pray with them also about their placement, wherever it was that they would end up. And so some of them I still communicate with today as they've already been placed in various ministries and let them know I'm still praying for them. And, and uh, it's been encouraging to see how God is using many of those students that had the opportunity to talk to, uh, even though they didn't come and serve here. Uh, but I, I know that during that time frame when a student is graduating from Bible college and they're going to go and serve in ministry somewhere, that it can be a little bit of a confusing time. And... Um, Honestly, in Bible college, they spend